Welcome back to the Aspen Institute Artificial Intelligence Week. From proletariat to precariat, labor in the age of automation, that's the debate we're about to have right here, right now. Now, the historian Yuval Noah Hariri predicts that just as mass industrialization creates the work, created the working class, the AI revolution will create a new unworking class. He's even as drastic as to predict, quote, people would be rendered useless, not my words, to creating wealth, unemployable because skill replaced, is replaced by algorithm. Now, while we all agree that AI will change the working world, um, we're here to try and decide today whether we are staring into an abyss or an ocean of opportunity. And here on Zoom to debate just that with me is Roger Bootle. He's an economist and chairman and founder of the economic research company Capital Economics. One of the things he rightly predicted against the trend was the dot-com bubble bursting. He also holds the Wolfson Prize, and he's written a book called The AI Economy, Work, Wealth and Welfare in the Robot Age. He says we should be optimistic that although AI will eliminate and change lots of jobs, it will create lots of others, in particular machines, and AI will never be better than humans at being human. I'm also very pleased to welcome Janina Kugel, who's a board member, advisor, and speaker. Um, she used to head human resources at Siemens, and she also advises the German government as part of the Labour Council of the German Labour Ministry. Currently, her Twitter feed is a lot more about the women's quota in German boardrooms than AI, uh, but she's previously said uh, that a strong society is one that is not afraid of change. She predicts that, yes, AI will destroy jobs, but it will create others. Labour will stay. Um, I'm also pleased to welcome Johannes Vogel. He's a member of the Bundestag's Free Democrat Party. He's Labour spokesman of the Free Democrats here in Germany. And before becoming an MP, he worked at the German Labour Agency. About AI, he says, the big technological developments in the past and today have been accompanied by a fear of surging unemployment, yet they ultimately led to more employment. Change can be be challenging, but if we embrace the potential of digitization, we can create new jobs and new industries. And we'll ask him about how he plans on doing just that. Uh, also with us is Andy Stern. He's a co-founder of the Workers' Benefit Fund. He's president emeritus of the Service Employees International Union, which has some two million members. He says, change is inevitable, it's progress that's optional. And over the last 25 years, technological advances and automation have been far more beneficial to the wealthy than they have been to workers. This is not an act of God or preordained, but without increased worker power or government intervention, the future's massive technological disruption to work and jobs will leave workers even farther behind. So let me start with Roger Bootle. Roger, I'd like to actually get you to respond to that. You are optimistic that jobs will be created, but please pick up what Andy Stern said. How optional is real progress and actual wealth for all? Schönichts. It could be true that the future could turn out to be extremely bleak. From an economic theoretical point of view, you can see circumstances under which um, there, were, there was effectively no demand for human skills or human activity, and large parts of the potential workforce were unemployed. That's possible. I think it's highly unlikely for a variety of reasons. Firstly, there's the historical evidence that some people have already referred to. Similar argu arguments have been put forward throughout the whole of history, and they proved to be completely unfounded. So I think we can be more specific than that. And it goes to um, what you mentioned in your introduction about my views. There are lots of skills and activities that human beings have taken part in over the years, many of them actually not being very enjoyable or fulfilling, which are going to be replaced by robots and AI. But then there's this whole aspect of human beings interacting with other human beings. Now, if in the future, because of things like COVID or other such things, um, people didn't want to interact with other human beings. They actively wanted to be as far away as possible from other human beings. Then there might be a problem. But I really can't see that, whether it's education, whether it's social care, health care, all sorts of things, even advice about how we look, how we should develop ourselves. I'm pretty convinced 
convinced that human beings will want to interact with other human beings, and that's where they will be the source of future employment. Now, whether and how there's a role for government there, that's another question which I guess we may come on. Andy Stern, let me get you to respond to that. You say there must be a role for trade unions. If anything, they must be strengthened, and there is a role for government, a stronger role to play. What do you mean by that? Well, I think what we've seen is even when we increase the number of jobs, it doesn't mean that they're decent jobs with decent work. And so many of the jobs that people are predicting, like in the care professions, whether it be home care or child care, at least in the United States, are jobs for women of color. They're not very well paid. They have few benefits. And so, yes, we can increase those jobs, but we will just continue to increase the inequality that exists and that the benefits of AI and technological change goes to a smaller and smaller group of people. So without intervention, without some form of redistribution, I think you're staring at a pretty hunger game type future uh, for workers in the world. Janina Kugel, you, I can see you nodding, actually. You have hands-on experience of restructuring as part of the corporate restructuring Vision 2020 Plus and Siemens. And uh, you are now advising the German government, which, of course, is concerned about just that, that um, the future of labor, uh, AI-driven labor, would deliver wealth for few. What is your advice that you are giving? Well, I think it's like what Andy said, is um, you have to make a clear differentiation whether, for example, you speak about jobs and the structures that you find in the predominantly in the United States. And if you look to Europe, where you have a different style and different social security system, I think it's, it's very dangerous to always compare industrial worlds um, one with each other because I think structures are different. Nevertheless, I think is for the time being, everyone has always believed that the, the task of upskilling and reskilling should lie in the responsibility of employers and employers only. And so pretty much um, that would actually mean is like once you have finished school or your primary education, it depends pretty much like on yourself and on your employer. But I think here comes exactly the point. Employers do only invest in people that they believe they can use also later on. And here comes the point in the massive change and disruption of technology the states and the government needs to take an active role in first um, creating transparency of what other jobs could actually come up and also, you know, what are the requested skills and qualifications you need. Secondly, a financing of it. And third, also, honestly, you know, um, just like places where people can study. And at the most optimistic situation, that should actually happen while people are still employed in their old jobs before they lose their job. But if you think at how things work today, either the government doesn't do anything or they wait until people get unemployed and then you retrain them. And that is far more expensive than if you would offer opportunities to retrain them and upskill them and reskill them into jobs. And clearly I confirm with Andy is like, it doesn't make sense to have thousands of jobs that actually you know come up where people can survive, but they cannot make up a living. Because then we see what is going to happen if democracy falls apart, if social imbalance becomes stronger. And I think that is a role where every government in the world that I can at least recall needs to change their strategy totally different than they have done over the last centuries of industrial revolution. Johannes Vogel from the pro-business free Democrats. Now your party has at its scathing criticism of the current corona budget, I'll just call it that right now, uh, because you feel that the status quo is being conserved way too far. Now, you yourself have been in charge in, in a previous uh, professional existence of retraining people to make them uh, fit for the next employment. At the same time, you say you're optimistic, particularly for aging societies, that if we embrace the potential of digitalization, we can, can create new jobs and new industries. Where does your optimism come? from well uh, well i'm an optimist um <laughs> in general but i think <laughs> if you if you look at the big transformations in the past i mean there, there, there always has been the situation that there there will be a lot of new jobs coming up if we are innovative and product, product if we're innovative enough and our productivity is high enough but of course the, the big question is how do we enable everybody really everybody to be a part of this uh, process. And so it is about education. Yes, we are a pro-business party, but we also are a pro-education party. And what I think is 
that Janina Kugel made the right point. What we need is like a whole second education system. In German, in the German language, the, the word ausgelernt is pretty important. I mean, normally you end your education after you finished your vocational training system, which is very successful in Germany, Germany or you finished your university. And after that, um, the numbers shows, the numbers we, we, we have like right now is that two thirds of the workforce are not regularly participating in further training. No reskilling, no upskilling, not on a regular basis. And I think that's the problem. We need a whole second education system, not only if people are unemployed, but before. And of course, that is a job for the companies within the companies. Of course, it is a job for um, the, um, uh, the federal employment agencies to support that. Not only if people get unemployed, but already before. Um, and I think we thirdly need really new instruments. For example, we have a famous um, a, a student support system called BAföG in Germany. And I think we need like a, a whole new system. We, we brought up an idea to create a so-called midlife BAföG so that you support, financially support everybody um, earning uh, less than the average income. Um, in, for example, being able to invest in their own re-education, reskilling, upskilling, um, and we need new instruments like that. And of course, this is an area where we need more state activity um, and more instruments. So it's not that free, pro business, free Democrats means we're against state activity. It depends on what state activity in which sector. So it's something like a student loan system that there is in Germany where people have to pay back parts or all depending on their yeah, parents' but, income. Yeah, but only parts, and that's the point. I think we need a new support system where perhaps with loans, but not only with loans, especially for the lower income, uh, lower incomes, um, after university, you know, for the, the whole, um, the, the whole two thirds or three quarters of your life uh, after you finished your first education. Andrew Stern, because since you're sitting in the U.S., isn't that exactly the, what would be debated as big state in the United States? Let me just take one step backwards and be a little bit provocative here. Um, you know, I think, and Janina's right, if you look at Germany, you know, you live in a different universe in terms of the, the role between business, government, and the state. And I would hate to hold you up as the rest of the way the rest of the world works, because in most of the world, like the Industrial Revolution has decimated large numbers of industrial workers in the UK and the US. You know, very few have found jobs, whether there's been retraining or trade adjustment assistance in our country that have been very fulfilling, being a greeter at Walmart is not really what you want to do after you spent 20 years with a middle-class union job. And so we've created a whole system of community colleges in our country. They failed us completely. We've talked about them for 30 years. So we have no model that I would say in most countries of the world where upskilling, reskilling, education is an answer to this problem particularly for people in their middle ages who get displaced, as opposed to how do we train younger people, as we've seen with computers who found jobs because they were familiar with digitization and, and technology right from the beginning, as opposed to their parents and grandparents who are very unfamiliar with it. So I, I think Germany's in a nice dream world because you can actually do these things, but the rest of the world is going to be overrun, you know, by displacement, you know, by good well wishes of get yourself a job or a college education, which college child kids in our country are underpaid and undervalued in doing work that is underskilled. So even getting a college education is what we told one generation has really failed them. Um, I just want to say to everyone watching out there, we will also, of course, get to your questions in about 25 minutes from now. So please get them in early so they have a good chance of being answered. And I'd like to ask Roger Butel, because, of course, you do a lot of economic policy analysis. And the last thing many companies actually, and that's the one thing everywhere in the world would write to, uh, want to hear right now, is that um, once they've managed to survive corona, there's extra responsibility for them to take on new challenges in terms of in terms of long-term training for their own staff. So um, having agreed that there's no silver bullet, uh, what kind of advice are you giving governments and 
um, what should they not be doing? Well, I think um, I agree very much with what Andrew and others have said, that here there is surely a very big role for government. I mean, to some extent, individuals can provide for their own interests here, but not all individuals can. They may not have the financial resources to start. And to some extent, companies can help with this. But I can't remember who said it earlier on. The fundamental problem is that there's a big externality here, as we economists say. If you, a company currently employing someone, invest a fortune in training them up, you've got no guarantee that that person's going to stay with you. So you are bound to underinvest in training them. Uh, this is an area where the state, it seems to me, has got a very, very major role, often in combination and cooperation with private sector employers. Um, I agree very much with the comments made earlier at Zandi, I think, about the education system. Certainly the solution to the problem isn't, I think, to, to shove more and more of our youngsters through university, we call it in England, I guess you'd call it college in the States, and then equip them with the sort of degrees that they have uh, uh, won recently because these are proving frankly in many cases next to useless so the, the key to this issue is first of all reforming the educational process itself so that um, kids come out of um, school college university what you will not only with specific skills but perhaps more importantly an adaptability and a preparedness to carry on learning new skills through their lives and that also that we establish financially and institutionally the processes funded by the state by which people can adapt and change those skills as needs arise. Those are, I think, the fundamental things. What I don't want government to do, and I think it's where I think the danger lies, is making its mind up as to where the new jobs are and then putting an awful lot of effort into subsidising and promoting those sectors because I think it's pretty clear that no one can be absolutely sure where the new jobs are. I've got my suspicions, but I don't really want government involved in all that. I do want government involved big time in overcoming the market failure with regard to education and training, and in particular, being um, very compassionate about people who, for one reason or another, are left behind. And again, someone else made reference earlier, I think it was Andy again, to the Industrial Revolution. I wasn't quite clear whether he meant the first industrial revolution or the, the more recent one. But he's right in both cases. Um, we have this word, don't we, in English language, Luddite. I don't know if you have that in German as well, referring not favorably to this chap Ned Ludd, who supposedly in the early 19th century went around smashing up machinery uh, on the grounds that this destroyed jobs. And in the economics textbook, of course, Ned Ludd is portrayed usually as some sort of idiot who was operating against progress <laughs> and destroying jobs and prosperity. I mean, the key thing is that as far as people like Ned Ludd was concerned, he was right. <laughs> the machines did destroy jobs early on and large numbers of working people lost their livelihoods and the state did not intervene to give any support. And to some extent that's been true in Britain and America over the last 30 years as a result of losing jobs primarily to technology and also to China and East Asia. So we mustn't make that mistake again. So Janina Kugel, I mean, you, um, you're very much accustomed to the corporate perspective. What did persuade you in the past? What does persuade an employer to invest heavily into lifelong learning of its own staff? Also, of course, running the risk that that's an investment that they won't, that won't pay off for their own company. Well, I think Raja made a fair point that, um, that of course, is like the better people are getting educated, the higher the risk is that they get go somewhere else. Um, and again, here, I would make a differentiation between, for example, what you would find in Central Europe or in Germany um, compared to some of the anglo-section world, where you have equal standards and you have trained workers. And not only, and I fully, I fully um, agree to, to college, um, college degrees or university degrees are not making the trick why we have an over academization of people and we need to have the right skills on a working level and especially more techniques and more mechanical and engineering know-how comes into there. You need to have a skill thing. And here comes exactly my point. Um, when you have a system, like for example, you have in the, in the United States, people leave high school and then pretty much the only thing that they are getting if they don't go to college is training on the job. As an employer, you need to invest a hell lot, and especially if technology arises, to train them that they are able to be really productive. And if you measure the amount of hours that workers are productive, you would be scared of the number you're actually going to figure out. So this is one of the things. It's not a, a cheap thing to do. So as an employer, 
investing in your people and treating them and giving them fair working conditions and good benefit situations, depending on which country you're operating, also keeps up a very high probability that they're going to stay with you. You will always have to make a differentiation between, let me call it the global elite, people that are super well skilled and they could work anywhere. And I'm speaking not only about those with an academic background, welders, for example. Welders can choose wherever they want to work and they get awfully lot paid because they have something, they have a skill that is still very much demanded and no robot can actually like totally replace it to this point. And I personally don't believe it will. The other thing is some of the skills, um, digital skills, technical skills, um, you know, how to, how to interact in the new world of technology are skills that are highly demanded in every industry. And there's only few people that do bring those skills along. So as an employer, even if you could fire everyone that you wanted, right? I mean, which is impossible in Germany, you will not be able to rehire the people, at least not for a fair deal, because they are requested anywhere and it's awfully expensive. So here I would always say is like retrain the people that you're having. And if you do that, just to give you a very practical example, if you, for example, work on a shop floor and you still have um, people that are carrying around um, the goods, you know, to bring them to the production bills, And then at some point you, for example, implement a fully automated logistic plan. Still, you need to know which part needs to be where, whenever, and if you take, and it doesn't take longer than six to 12 months, depending on the pre-education of everyone, to retrain the people to use the logistic systems, they know everything already. The only thing that they don't know is instead of like moving carriages around, they have to sit on a computer and train everything there. And here comes what Andrew said is, of course, the younger generation is a little bit more likely to learn how to use computers, but the others also do have the know-how. So that also, I think, requires a rethinking of like whom you need to reskill. But coming back also to us individually, and I, for example, always ask the question to everyone if I have an audience, that I always like say, how many times and how many hours do you invest every week or every month into learning new skills that you don't need for your job today? And it's interesting to figure out that there is a high amount of people age 40 and older that don't invest any time in there. So it's also us that need to stay employable. So for me, the responsibility is pretty much like also from a business perspective. If you don't invest in the people that you know, that you trust and have been working for you, you will first of all not get them on the market. And even if you get them on the market, they will be more expensive than if you retrain them. So I think it is a rethinking also for companies because most of the companies see training as an investment, as a cost and not as an investment into human resource that they need further on. Johannes Vogel, are you going to convey that uh, message to the big employers here in Germany? Or do you not have to? Uh, well, I, I do it already all the time uh, when, I, when I have a conversation or a little chat with them about the, uh, the topic. But I think Janina is 100% um, correct. I mean, that's just right. Um, but I, like I said before, as a politician and as somebody who, who has worked before for a government agency, I definitely do see um, a, a role for, for state activity here, a large role for state activity here. I mean, we would all agree across the aisle, um, no matter what party, that one of the, the, the most important jobs uh, the state and society has is uh, taking care of proper education. The thing is, how do we define education? Uh, when does it end? Does it end at the beginning of your working career or is that one of the one of the ideas of the past that we have to overcome? And I think we have to. So there is a role, like I said before, there is a role, of course, for um, the big companies. And Janina Kugel laid out why it is uh, rational for them to do so. But I also think that there is a large and growing role for the state. And I say it as a liberal in the European sense, but I really believe it here. Andrew Stern, so we, can we call off um, the the employer crisis that could be sparked through artificial intelligence? Can we call it off? Not at all. Um, you know, I think as Roger said, we're all making predictions, you know, without much based on the past. And maybe because I come from a country where we had a, have a president still who defied all predictions, all norms, all behaviors to create a new normative set of values that it's hard to believe that things can't change despite you know 
decades or centuries of, of history. So, you know, I think we do not know, and we've never had a situation where machines can think. And I'm not saying having agency, I'm just saying having beyond automation and before agency, you know, and even in Janina's example of the logistics, in most of those situations, there's far less people at the end of the process than there were at the beginning of the process. So, you know, we can talk about this in stark terms of we're going to eliminate all jobs. But I think as, as you opened with the McKinsey study and other things say there are an enormous amount of tasks that more and more can be done by machines different than kind of the machines that put the windshield in the Oops. No, you're coming across fine. We heard okay. you. Okay, that, that put the windshield in the car, but machines that actually can do a certain amount of, of thinking. And therefore, you know, I don't think this crisis is over. And I don't think we need to wait to see who's right, Roger or I. I think we need to do scenario planning. There's no reason to sort of say, let's just see who wins this race. Let's talk about if Roger's right and I'm wrong, then a lot of these things will be a lot easier. But if I'm right, what are we going to do? Are we just gonna let people fend for themselves? Where's the money gonna come for the social safety net for all the people that are unemployed as we've learned in the COVID crisis? You know, I think we have a very cavalier attitude at the elite that somehow this is all gonna work out and the people at the bottom who are gonna pay the price, you know, are not so lucky if it doesn't work out. Roger Boodle, I'd like you to respond to that, really, because we're, um, when we talk Germany, we, we talk uh, about a system that, of course, doesn't translate even to the United States or other Western countries. But can you please um, just do a quick analysis for us? When we talk about jobs changing, jo jobs um, basically no longer existing and other jobs being created, can you do some kind of geographic prediction? Is this all going to take place within national boundaries or isn't part of the problem that you have tens of thousands of jobs created in one corner of the world that are lost in a different corner. So you have very regional problems to a global trend. Well, I think this is going to be very, who knows, in deference to what Andrews has said, but I think it's going to be quite different from the uh, impact on jobs that occurred through globalization, which as you say, rightly say, redistributed jobs all around the world. I think what we're likely to see actually is similar processes operating more or less everywhere, um, with one exception. And this goes to my worries about too much state intervention, and certainly my worry about the state trying to restrict the advances of AI. I think if we were to do that, then I could see the West losing a large number of jobs again to countries in the East, which didn't so restrict the advances of AI. And I think um, governments should be very conscious of the danger of over-regulating what happens with robots and AI uh, and pretty much allowing them, allowing the market to decide that and then concentrating on the issues we've been discussing, that's to say training and retraining on the one hand and uh, if necessary generous provision for the losers from this process. On the other, uh, I mean I agree with much of what Andrew has been saying but one thing I wanted to take issue with him on um, the notion that you know, if we get machines and AI doing large amounts of activity and the rich becoming richer and the poor becoming poorer, that somehow or other where on earth is the money to come from for social programs? Well, money's there to come from precisely the first bit of that statement. That's to say, look, either you believe that AI and robots are going to increase productive potential or you don't. If they increase productive potential, then they also increase the potential to redistribute income to the poorer members of society. Now, that's not necessarily going to happen automatically, and that's very much where I agree with Andrew. And of course, some countries, maybe the United States will be one of these, wouldn't do enough. But in principle, if this revolution adds to productive potential, then it adds to our potential to help people at the bottom. And that does demand that we uh, have the, the right institutions and the right policies. But the potential is, in my mind, definitely there. Johannes Vogel, as a German MP, I just had Saskia Esken a short while ago, the um, co-head of the Social Democrat Party here in Germany, telling me, well, that is actually a good thing if we all work a bit less and um, there's the income still being produced. It's a question of distribution. Do you agree? Is that where you should or is that where the FDP is making proposals? 
Well, well, I'd agree that it's a good thing that um, if jobs are changing, that there also is an well overlying trend that stupidity is going down uh, and people tend to have more well, interesting, diverse jobs. Of course, like we talked about it before that, of course, we have to make sure that everybody is able to cope with that. But there's also a chance in that. But I think I'd agree what, what, uh, with what Roger just said, that, of course, we have to, I mean, we are not living on an island um, uh, and we live in a globalized world. We have, for example, China uh, doing a great effort with the, well, top-down, state-led top-down innovation uh, surprisingly, that's that's not what what I'm convinced of the way of the future for us. But um, of course, we have to stay. Pro we have to uh, ha hold our product productivity high, and of course, we have to invest in what makes us strong, which is uh, bottom-up creativity. I'd say, uh, but if we just uh, well getting lazy and working less, I don't think that's that's going to happen, and that's not how we we solve the uh, the transformations of the past for example i i remember the debates i was younger but of course i read a lot, lot about it and i remember the 90s where we had the debates about the industrial robots i mean we had the debates in germany as well that everybody is going down leading to uh, leading to disaster i can remember the spiegel the 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 news magazine spiegel covers saying they well germany robots and and computers they will lead to mass unemployment and all that and now and we decided in Germany decided to have a much higher use of industrial robots to invest in innovativeness in uh, keeping our productivity high and in the end um, it worked I mean it, it doesn't lead to high unemployment uh, the, the opposite happened of course we had to do some social reforms as well of course we had to do redistribution uh, that that's all correct but you can only do that um, if your innovativeness is high enough and I don't think that laziness uh, leads to that. But how would you then uh, weigh, I'll get to you in a moment, Janina, how would you weigh up the, um, the question of who sets the norms for the use of artificial intelligence in the future? This is also something, as Aske Eskin was very strong about, she sees Germany, sees Europe in the role of laying down those norms. Um, do you believe that that is something that is achievable even by Europe? Well, I think so, but only, uh, and she's right with that. Uh, I'd, ag I'd agree on that uh, in, in general. Of course, we have, we, we have to have a debate about the details, but uh, of course, um, uh, you have to um, uh, set the norms. Um, that's what we as democratic societies do. Um, but I think Europe can, but only the whole of Europe. Um, and that's, I think, is the, the, nearly the most important point here. Of course, we have to use the might and the power of the large single market um, and to use it in the digital age as well. Um, I, I think that, for example, um, uh, GDPR um, uh, was a not so bad example for that. It was not well implemented, uh, and I had a lot of debates about it with uh, with small and medium sized uh, companies. For example, in my constituency in the Sauerland, uh, very rural but highly industrialized, and they sort of were, why, 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 they, they were like, well, why do we have to care about it? But I think the 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 idea that we use the the power and the might of the single market it's sheer size um, and to to set rules in the digital age um, perhaps different rules to set the, the, well, the democratic um, democratic gold standard for example in uh, for all these questions in difference to China I think is one of the perhaps one of the most important rules we have for the European Union in the upcoming years Janina Kugel, you wanted to respond to a point. I wanted to respond to, to a point which pretty much like also goes to, to what Johannes Vogel just said, is I think is we're still very narrow-minding in thinking in, in Europe, the US, and all of that. I think latest, you know, I mean, we already have a globalized economy. And with AI, it needs to be very clear that we cannot speak about skills in Europe. And I think that's the arrogance of the highly industrial countries in Western Europe and the United States or North America, that we still sometimes believe we are ruling the world and we will do that. And I always say is like, there is super high and skilled people in India, in China, and they are highly competitive and they are not worse equipped than anyone else in Western Europe or in North America. And I think therefore we have to look at it as a global competition 
And we need to understand that those times are over where pretty much like the high in demand innovation is done in the West and the rest will be pretty, pretty much like produced in the, in the East. It has already shown when you think about like the high tech companies, there are three US players and one Chinese players and Europe is far behind and will never pick it up again. Because, and here I agree with Roger, what, said, what Roger said is like, you know, my point was not about state and government coming in there of like trying to set the norms because the, the world is far too fast and it will move. And also with ethics, okay, if you're supposed to define it, and I think there is a lot of in favor of it, we need to hurry up because China will make its way anyway, one way or the other. And if we debate and they set the norms, it's too late. But what I believe needs to be totally reinterpreted is like, what is the basic education that we provide to people? Because Andrew and Roger both said, and I fully agree, we don't know how jobs will look like in five years or in seven years or in 10 years. These people, I would say it's like, you can maybe look ahead for 18 months, but not more than that. So what we need to provide everyone is like being flexible and having the basic skills to be retrained all the time. And I think this is a total different contradiction of like how to define it. And my last comment to that, we also have to understand that in the Western world, we are not as hungry as some people in the East. I mean, what I always like said in my global roles is like, if you believe you can do the same job in 30 hours and just like to give that, Germany is already among, you know, how many hours does a person work over the year is already at the lower bottom you know, in terms of productivity. So if we believe that only because here someone wants to work less, which I think is from a personal perspective, always something nice, we need to understand that there's someone else out there in the world with the same skills that is willing to work double the time to make an effort for his or her own life. And I think that is what we need to look at. It's a global competition, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of resources. Andrew Stern, what does that mean for the whole concept of collective bargaining? Um, if exactly that is the case, you have on one hand um, whole um, societies having the debate about um, work-life balance, less working hours, and at the same time people who want to use every opportunity for upskilling to at least get a foot in the door um, in terms of economic progress and actually flatly jobs. What challenge does that hold for trade unions worldwide? Well, I'd say two things. You know, first of all, I, I think we shouldn't, we make these very broad generalizations and I appreciate that that's the way we talk, but the truth is, you know, what drives a business is not a hundred percent of their workforce. You know, there's a skilled group of people. I think someone was saying, you know, that even if you got rid of the current group, you couldn't hire back the skills you needed. That's not true at every level. That's just true at certain levels because some jobs can easily be trained and skilled, but you're not going to find a great digital director or marketing director or finance person, you know, overnight. And so, you know, I think we have to be careful because I do think that, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the people, you know, will always work really hard, you know, will be more entrepreneurial. That's what their jobs will ex expect and that's what they will do. And then other people, the job doesn't mean quite as much to them. It's more of a source of income and satisfaction, but you know, whether they work 30 or 35 or 40 hours is just a different factor. I think what's important here is we always talk about business and we talk about government. And particularly government's just kind of a brute force, non-targeted you know, actor in the space. You know, we don't have sectoral thinking necessarily done by government. We don't have enterprise. We don't have geographic thinking. And, you know, one of the values of having workers and unions and others involved is when they're acting responsibly, we can get a much more cooperative, targeted way to solve problems. And in our country, for instance, you know, if you give everyone, you know, paid sick leave, you know, it, at a basic level, it's really significant. The question is, you know, what is the differentiation between an Uber driver getting sick leave and how does that work? And how does that work for a care worker? And how does that work for an executive? You know, government doesn't do a very good job differentiating. So I think there's an enormous role of trade unions if trade unions are willing collectively to, as I started off by saying, that understand that change is inevitable. 
You know, we are not going to stop change. We are not Luddites. It's progress that we should be focused on. And progress does deal with education. And as Roger said, you know, redistribution and generous, you know, benefits for the people that are the losers who may be too old or not have the right abilities to do that. And so, you know, I, I think unions need to really not be the ones who are saying, you know, how do we regulate everything? But how do we regulate that workers do well? going forward, whether the training happens or doesn't happen, they shouldn't pay the price, you know, if there is a failure, a systems failure by government or business. Uh, Roger, I'd like to take that back to you once again, because um, is it then, will this happen? Will this precariat suddenly exist because governments are too slow, transition is too fast, because, just because it happens historically, um, in, through artificial intelligence, is um, Hariri right who predicts that there will be people who are rendered, and I quote once again, not my words, useless to wealth creation, who actually are potential beneficiaries of a system that they no longer have a part in of creating wealth? Well, uh, we've been saying before, but I want to re-emphasise it, we just don't know, do we? And this makes government action particularly difficult and I think particularly dangerous. We have to, to some extent, I think, roll with events. Uh, now, I'm actually rather more optimistic than some people who have been speaking on this issue because you used the word suddenly just then. I don't think it is going to be sudden at all. It's going to be gradual. Um, it's amazing. If you look back 10, 12 years ago at what people were saying then about what will have happened with regard to artificial intelligence. Yes, some of it has transpired, materialized, an awful lot of it hasn't. I, I think we're going to see that uh, we are going to have time to develop new policies and approaches. In that regard, um, what's been said and debated a moment ago about leisure is I think tremendously important. I don't think it's right to characterize the idea of people spending more of their life at leisure than working as being lazy. And nor do I think that this opportunity uh, to take that choice means that you're, as it were, losing out in the global competition against China and Asia. That's to say, I think it's perfectly feasible for people in the West, including Germany, the United States, Britain, all these countries, to say, well, you know, I think I'd, I'd rather work fewer hours. I recognize that means I'm going to earn a bit less income than I would have done if I'd worked 40 hours or whatever, but I can still have as much money as I've I've been getting over the last year or two, thanks to the uh, benefits of artificial intelligence. Now, the results of all that would, of course, be that the economies of the West would decline in size relative to the economies of the East if they made a different choice, the ones in the East. But so what? That's open to us to make that choice. And I think choosing to be less stressed, spend more time on leisure pursuits, more time with your family than hard at work all the time is not being lazy. And after all, if you look back over the last 150 years. That's exactly what people in the industrialized countries have done. If you look at average working hours across the year, in nearly all our countries, you'll see a massive reduction uh, over the last 100, 150 years. And we haven't become lazy because of that. Janina, I'd like you to respond to that. Well, I can actually only say yes, I agree. I mean, if you if you look, um, you know, 100 years ago, you were working seven days a week or six days a week. And now we're, I mean, it is as it has been the unions like, I don't know, Andrew, when that has been like 100 years ago, that they pretty much like you said, is like Saturday is off and Sunday is off. I agree. But it comes back, Roger, to the fact is like, what is the work that we're doing? And what are you getting paid for? And it also comes back to one of the first statements that Andrew said, um, you know, we pay much less for care work, even though it becomes even more important, especially in, in societies that are becoming const constantly more older um, than, for example, those that actually are the industrial jobs. My pledge will always be that I think is this is another I don't want to call it industrial revolution, but it is to a certain extent. And I think we have to let go from everything that we have done so far. I mean, not let go from everything, but we have to really think in some reforms and not, you know, believe in, in everything that we did in the industrial revolution, where you pretty much like had jobs from eight to five and where you could measure the time. With all of the flexibility, we need new norms. We need new regulations and we need new ways of thinking. And for example, what I would say for Germany, we always have 
pretty much the same approach is like there is one fits all solution for either whether you work in a plant or whether you have a highly skilled job that you could do pretty much like all around the time or pretty much you work in a global time. And we don't even have yet the flexibility to our labor legislation to apply to all of the different jobs. So what I would like us to think is like to stay with what we need for the job groups where we also need to have some security. And yes, I am a strong believer that having a social security, having a free democracy as we know it in the West and as we define it in the West and have some democratic stability is going to be a benefit for everyone in society. Living in the world or living in countries where you have the ultra rich people and the ultra poor people is not going to bring you the stability that you also need to grow. So in that respect, I only think is we need to let go from some of the beliefs that we had over the last 30 or 40 years after the Second World War. And we have to define new standards and new beliefs to actually master the future and keep, I think, the social security as we at least know it in Europe. And I think this is a pro. And as Andy said, I think this is something where we are better off than North America. Johannes Vogel, because you're a lawmaker, I would like you to uh, respond uh, to that particular point when it comes to systemic reevaluation of who delivers stability in Germany, um, who delivers actually stable conditions for a democracy, because at the end of the day, and we're not going to get too deep into that, but we are in a system competition between China and the West in terms of being able to deliver. We've seen this in the pandemic, which is a, a particular point in case, but of which certainties would you be willing to let go? Care workers were mentioned here. They're actually demonstrating outside the German health ministry today because they've been told a lot of times that they are system relevant and yet they are low uh, earners here in Germany. So what needs to be reassessed in the cold light of day and what is needed in the future and which skill sets cannot be replaced through artificial intelligence? Well, good question, but a broad question. Um, first of all, I, I, I'd like to add uh, or add on what, what Roger just said. I don't think that we have a disagreement uh, there. I, my point was just that I think we have to to uh, keep in mind that, of course, it all is working if we as a society stay innovative and productive. The productivity is high enough. Of course, that's important. Um, and what what we learn in the pandemic, and of course in cri where crises crises shows the character, I think. And what we learn in the pandemic is um, we, we see some areas where, of course, we had um, uh, well, I think the the false priorities. Care workers is a good example. Uh, we had the debate for quite some years before, um, but now I think it's it's finally obvious for everybody that, of course, we have to to bring up. Um, a payment for for not only for care workers but also for um, medicine personnel um, uh, when it comes to ambulance drivers and all these kind of, of jobs and important roles in our society uh, and I would also say that um, what Janina just said is correct that we also see that a lot of the rules we had, well, are no longer fitting to the modern reality. And that became obvious in the crisis as well. For example, I don't think that we have to, to work um, like a day more in, uh, per week or something, not at all. But we already see, we're already seeing that people uh, want to be more self-determined when to work. And where to work, and we see the we can see a cultural change taking place uh, during the the Corona crisis when it comes to the use of home office, when it comes to um, um, the use of mobile working, and all these um, well modern self determined ways to decide for yourself where to work and when to work. But we see that the rules, the laws, are not fitting at all. I mean, what what we is what is taking place today in Germany. It's, um, the, um, it's uh, for millions of people every day are uh, um, uh, breaking the law. 
no one cares about it because we're in a crisis. But of course, in a, a, a in a um, uh, rule of law society and a rule of law state, um, that's not going to work forever. And the, the 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 answer could only be that we modernize. Um, uh, I think the laws we have here, for example, when it comes to um, the labor regulations. Um, but I w- w- would also like for one minute to add uh, something what Janina Kugel said in the statement before, which is. Um, uh, we, we, we have a lot, uh, which is who is the West these days? Um, you asked before who's setting the rules when it comes to AI regulation, for example. And what we can see, of course, that we have fundamental disagreements when it comes to ethical questions uh, to China or the, the Communist Party of China. Um, uh, and the, 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 the question is who is responding? Is it Europe? Is it Europe and the US? Or should we define the West uh, defined as democratic free societies um, in the Pacific century um, on a global level? Do we have enough cooperation um, when it comes to the free nations of Asia? Do we, can, can't we, shouldn't we set the, the rules when it comes to ethic regulation of AI, when it comes to trade, investment, more together? I mean, we don't have a single organization on global level where uh, Asian, uh, American, European, free democratic societies come together and debate on these questions. Not a single organization. And I think that that shows that we have to, um, well, modernize our mindset as well. Um, Who do we have to work together with um, in the Pacific century we're already living in? Andrew Stern, I would like to uh, pose a question to you, which is coming from the audience watching uh, us here. Populist parties have become a big problem on both sides of the Atlantic because mega trends such as globalization have created groups of winners and groups of losers. How do we make sure that we take the whole society along um, with the next major trend? I think AI is meant by that. So I, I think people are exactly right. I mean, it's odd that in our country, the Democratic Party you know, which used to be the party of the workers is now much more the party of the college educated. And the Republican Party is becoming much more the party of the workers because the workers have not benefited in all the changes in society. So I I think, you know, we all know that, you know, people having less, earning less, feeling forgotten, you know, are very good organizing grounds for people who have different motivations. So to me, it's a very simple question. I think Roger said it, you know, much better than certainly with more credibility. If we're going to keep producing wealth as a world through through technology and productivity, how is it going to be distributed? And when, you know, five people in the United States have as much wealth as 50% of the people, you know, we have a problem. When Amazon pays no taxes, we have a problem. And so, you know, we all can talk about, you know, what does it mean that, you know, people are upset and angry? Well, they've been left behind. They worked hard. They did everything that society asked them to do. And they found themselves to be in a position where what they had dreamed of and hoped for is no longer true. And we've done nothing for them but tell them to get a college education, which hasn't worked either for their children and put many of them in debt. And so why would you expect people to not respond to people who pay attention to their grievances rather than people you know, who tell them to go get a college education. That brings us actually to a very hands-on question, clearly uh, aimed towards uh, Janina Kugel. Um, what would you recommend your children or grandchildren to study or train in now, uh, right now? In other words, which professions will be the next to be made obsolete and which fields will become more important in the future? Welding, I understand. Welding would be one. I mean, first of all, I have to say I'm very that someone believes I already have grandchildren, but nevertheless. <laughs> Somebody was thinking that. very far into the future. <laughs> and, you know, recommendations to children about, um, you know, um, from, from the parents is always a bad thing. What I would definitely recommend them is, um, first of all, I would always recommend that do something that that you enjoy doing, because I think whatever we do, um, you know, we spend a lot of it. But keep that mindset open that you have to relearn and uh, learn new things constantly. And I think this is for me the, the only good thing to say, because if I would now give a recommendation, what are the jobs that are missing today? I mean, we have seen that over the last 30 decades or like three decades as well. I mean, then you give a recommendation 10 years later, you're not searching for those people anymore. So I think what we need to understand is like you start in one job, 
that is not going to be the job that you retire. Um, and secondly, just to really come back, and maybe that is again a very, um, what should I say, a very privileged statement. But nevertheless, I think we need to understand that the ambiguity of the world is is going to increase, and therefore, I think we also need to have people that do understand that there is no simple answers to some of the big questions out there. So I think you need to have a thorough know-how also about what is going on to make the right judgments. That will be my recommendations. And I would hope, and I would be very proud if I could give the, the answer, but I think Roger, Andy, and we, every one of us said is like, there is not the one thing that we can predict the future. And so I think is stay open and be ready to, to learn. And Roger, one more question with begging you to give us a very short answer to a complex question. One of the recommendations of the ILO Global Commission on the Future of Work was to guarantee social prote protection from birth to old age that supports people's needs throughout their lives. Is that realistic and how could it be implemented? You can make it a yes or no question. Is it realistic? You want a short answer? Hmm? You want a short answer? Yes, please. No. Thank no, you very no. much. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I saw that one coming, actually, that's why I knew it would be brief. Uh, thank you to Andrew Stern, Johannes Vogel, Roger Butel, and to Nina Kugel for joining us here today. And in a couple of minutes from now, I will be handing over to my colleague for this day, Zara Polak. She's an Aspen Young leader. She's a trained archaeologist and anthropologist, but worked for the past seven years on tech startups. So she's living proof that you don't continue to do what you trained on already. Um, Sarah will um, have a conversation with me, me, Michael Betancourt on the cultural impacts of artificial intelligence. That coming up in just a couple of minutes from now. And to my whole panel, thank you so much for joining us today.